Well, good morning. Why don't we begin? Because it's, a, it's 11. I like to be on time. Because it's Mother's Day, and I'm sure you want to go on and have lunch as well. So, from Genesis to Revelation, just going to say it again. From the beginning of time to the end of time, from Eden to eternity, God is relentlessly pursuing people for relationship. And he does it not once, but this, again, this is Israel is meant to show us how he comes in these visible manifestations, not once, but multiple times, to reveal himself to us. And to do what? To be in relationship. And so it's all, the very first day in this three-week time together, I said it's all about relationship. God comes from heaven to earth. And so it really makes the story of the Bible uh, kind of user-friendly when you think about it in terms of relationship, doesn't it? A lot of people are very intimidated of the Old Testament because, well, how does it connect to the new? And a lot of people are intimidated of, of the hard parts of the Bible. Whatever. But the whole, the, the beauty of biblical theology and taking this one theme about the divine presence and how it is all about relationship is just to see how by divine design, God has taken a theme and several themes and woven them together to create a broader story. And it's really encouraging because we're a part of that story. We are a people, a place, and a presence, are we not? We, because of our faith in Jesus, as I said last week. So it's a beautiful picture, and we are inserted right into it. You want to see where we are? Just in case, we're, where, we, where we are in this whole storyline? We're right here. Acts, we're, we're Acts chapter 2, where we, because of our faith in Jesus, have believed. And we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And we have become the people of God. We experience his presence through the Holy Spirit. The place for our relationship to unfold um, is within our very, our very lives, our very bodies house the divine presence. Uh, so people, place, and presence is all fulfilled in us, is it not? We said that the very first day. So that, that's pretty dramatic. So I'll put, I'll put our people, place, and presence back up here. Okay. People. God is... People, place, and presence. Let's just remind ourselves of that. And that's where we are. And when I look at this, and I'll say this more at the end, but when I look at this, this is redemptive history that, yes, we are a part of, but it still means there's more to come. So if, if this happened, if Genesis happened, if the glory comes and fills the tabernacle, if the glory comes and fills the temple, if the glory departed and doesn't come back to a second temple, if the glory comes in flesh and blood in the incarnation, and if the glory shows up in temples not made with human hands, the glory is going to come again, Amen. and all will see him. And that puts the hairs on my arm, my, the hair, and I even just now saying that, it makes the hairs on my arms stand up, because this is a reality, and that's all that's left. That's all that's left. And he's waiting to come back and retrieve for himself a people so that his presence can always be with us and there will always be a place for the relationship to unfold of the course in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's where I'm going to end. But there's this waiting stage that we're in right now because why? He's gathering for himself more people to be in relationship with him. He's gathering more people to experience uh, who he is and what he has in store uh, for a relationship. So that's just the bigger picture of where we are and where we're, we're, we're in this waiting stage. But now let's kind of conclude uh, this discussion. Let me just tell you, it's very hard to take this theme and do it in three weeks. <laughs> you asked Marcus last night, I, we had a graduation, so I've been really busy with seminary stuff Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And after graduation yesterday, I was thinking, how can I just kind of cap it all to get, put it all together in one hour. <laughs> so here's my best shot at it. <laughs> Knowing that there's more opportunity down the road. So last week we did talk though about that first great crescendo where God comes from heaven to earth and he initiated relationship with Abram through the, through the covenant. And we talked about the beauty of that, how the biggest obstacle to fulfilling a people, place, and presence was humankind. And then God provided for that obstacle in the covenant ritual in Genesis 15 because he provided 
for whoever would not follow the covenantal obligations, the inferior in the relationship, he took on that, but also for the superior. So he vowed at that moment to guarantee the promises that, will deal, that God will deal with all obstacles to fulfilling a people, place, and a presence. And we saw how the cross then delivered on that promise. That's just a quick little reminder of what we did last week. But a very, I think, one of those key moments, key crescendos in the biblical narrative, that's a game changer. And I think, I think we were touched by that reality of how Genesis points us to the cross. So then the question that I want to ask us for today, and we'll take a few minutes to look at it, is who then is this God who relentlessly pursues for relationship? Who is this God who comes from heaven to earth and reveals himself for relationship? And it's important that we ask that question because it's in asking who he is more specifically that we understand then his character. And then that all ties in to this big picture of why he continually comes from heaven to earth. So there are a couple texts that are going to help us answer this question. So that's the question that's before us. Who is this God that's relentlessly pursuing us for relationship? Well, he has a name. And we're going to first start in the Old Testament. A few texts in the Old Testament are going to take us to the New. But he has a name, and we're introduced to him early on in the Old Testament, and it's in Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And this, this, these texts, are, are they're building blocks about who this God is. And so we bump into him in Exodus chapter 3, and the context is Moses who was called by God. Do you remember Moses is called? He's minding his own business. He's tending the sheep out in Midian, and he has this supernatural encounter with God, and God says to him, you know what? I'm going to use you in a powerful way, and I'm going to use you to do what? Release, to set my children free from, from bondage. And there's this whole give and take in Exodus, you know the story, between God and Moses. Are you sure? What about someone else? Why me? Etc. But before he gets into the questioning phase of this whole thing, we read this. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And verse 12 of chapter 3 of Exodus says this. And God said, I am with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And now here comes the question that's going to get an answer. Moses said to God, well, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? This is the one of the most challenging verses you go, because it's not getting an answer. And so here's what, here's what God says. You know, to the question, what's your name? Oh, like this clarifies it. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you're going to tell the Israelites. I am sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So what we, right at the outset, we are being introduced to somebody that is named, I am sent me to you. And then he says, the Lord, the God of your fathers is is sending me to, is sending you. Now let's unpack this just for a few minutes. What is your name? In the biblical narrative, when, when a name is being talked about, it's more than just an introduction. So in other words, it's not like Moses wants an introduction from, to, uh, uh, from God to himself, but what, God, what Moses is asking is about his character. Are you <clears throat> the kind, who are you? First of all, is your character such that you're going to do what you just said? You're going to use me to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. So he's not asking, hi, my name is Donna, and who are you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, my name's Lee. Come on, come with me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Say, say your name's who? Lee. Lee? Yeah. Okay, hi, Lee. Nice to meet you. <laughs> it's way more than that. It's not just a name. It's not just, right, it is a character. Right? And so that's the first thing that we want to highlight is this, is that he's asking about your, his character. Right? 
And then if you notice a few other things, it says this, I am who I am, twice, I am sent me to you, right? Now what is the significance of this? What does that mean? I am who I am. Well, this is where knowing the language is really quite fun because the designation when he says, I am who I am, um, and actually it's, you know, the best way to say it is I, from verse 12, I am with you. And then it says in verse 14, I am who I am. It says it three times, but the point is this, is that the word that is used when it says I am, and I put it up here in Exodus 3, I am who I am, it comes from a verb in biblical Hebrew that means to be. And so it's a continuous, ongoing presence. I am the one who always is. It's an active being, not a distant being, not someone who is you know, inactive, but he's active. So the whole point is this. We are introduced to this individual named Yahweh, and it is, he's saying, I am. I am equals Yahweh, and in our Bibles, it's all caps. It's the Lord, right? It's L-O-R-D. It's all in caps. Mm-hmm. And so I am equals Yahweh, I am equals the Lord, and I am is the derivative. So right here, Yahweh, the name Yahweh means I am. So we're getting. So what that means is he's present, he's active, he's with, and he's ready to respond by virtue of his name. Does that make sense? Well, it makes a lot of sense in biblical Hebrew when you see how the word is also derived. It's it's amazing thing. There, are, it's the main word for to be. And this is how it then is translated. All right, so that's the first thing, is we are introduced in this passage in Exodus 3 to the special name of God, and his name is Yahweh. In your Bibles, all caps. And and we have to understand right now, if we don't get that, then what we see later on is not going to be as impactful. But this means, at least in the context of... Yes? Yes. Yahweh and Lord, are they synonymous? Yes, exactly. They're synonymous. And, And the way you see it showing up... Because it's not Elohim or El. That would be God with a little G. That would be, that would be translated God. But yes, they are one and the same. Well, well yes. they're not synonymous in the way they mean the same thing. So how do know? Because they can't pronounce the word, right? So, so, so the, no, this does mean the same. Yahweh. Yahweh and Lord mean the exact same thing in terms of how it's translated in our in our Hebrew Bible. Well, I mean, it's just because they can't say the same. Oh, right, 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 yes. So it's out of the language, which means Lord. But they're substituting that for the sacred name because they can't pronounce it. But Yahweh right. has a closer meaning to the verb to be in some, some scholars. <laughs> That's a, it's a whole discussion in terms of the Hebrew side of it, but the name derives from the to be verb in Hebrew, and the closest way that we get it in English is in all caps, Lord, to communicate um, something that is basically what you're saying is in, we can't communicate it, and there was there was exactly. So this is the first this is the first piece of information that we are introduced to. Who is this God? Who is this God? Right. And his name is Yahweh. And what is his name mean? I am who I am. His name means, and let's say it, presence. All right, let me just write it up here, my fun little board. Presence. Just like the to be verb means, it's active. He's going he's gonna to show up. He's going to do something. Presence means active. action, does it not? Yes. And presence means um, revelation. We'll just do it that way too. Okay, good. All right, then we move to Exodus. There's another text that's going to unfold. Who is this God? Exodus chapter 6, you can write that down next. Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 through 8. And we, go, we learn this. This is, again, uh, good old Moses. His call has challenged him because God told him he was going to bring the Israelites out from Egypt. And then guess what? He makes the task for the Israelites who are in Egypt more difficult because he doesn't provide any materials for them to make the bricks, right? And so at that point in the narrative, Moses is wondering, okay, you really going to do what you said? Are you, are you really? How, how are you going to be with us? 
And so here's the question. Uh, how, he says this in verse chapter 5. Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, nothing but trouble has come upon me. So this necessitates another revelation. Two through, two, well, actually, it's, it's, it's really two through eight. Two through eight um, in Exodus chapter six. You can write that down. And this is what the Lord says to Moses in response to this question. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand <coughs> to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession, and then he ends it, I am the Lord. So it's punctuation. If you were to go and highlight it in, you know, in your English Bible, I am the Lord is a punctuation to this next phase of the revelation of who Yahweh is. And so what's added to the picture here is a few more pieces. All right. We have added to the picture is, so up here, I am equals Yahweh, the Lord, the God of your fathers. And now what does he say? I am Yahweh. And now that name means more because he's fleshing it out. And what does he say he's going to do? that wasn't said here, well, or is added to what wasn't said there. He's going to save, can write that down. He's going to save, he's going to d deliver, right? Anything else? Give the land, the land is in view there. Can everybody see that? And it's kind of hard, you guys can see over there, okay, land. So he adds to the picture of who Yahweh is. Uh, he says, I promise to save, deliver, to make you my people. All of this language right there in 2 through 8, I promise to be your God, okay, God, and do what? Be with you. We're learning more about who this God is that comes from heaven to earth to be in relationship, right? Right? And so what we're seeing is, the name Yahweh, the name Yahweh who is active and present, and then this is how he's going to be active and present. He's going to save, he's going to deliver, he's going to give to the land, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people. That phrase, do you hear it? That phrase, I keep figuring out where my Bible is, um, I will take you as a people and, you will, and I will be your God. That's all about relationship. He's going to rest. The whole point of the Exodus is to rescue them for relationship. And therefore, that is really another, that terminology there is actually covenantal language at its finest. It's like marriage language. Actually, the language that's used there in Hebrew also, I will say, is often for marriage I, where a man takes a woman uh, for relationship in marriage. The idea of Taking, I will take you to myself as a people, and I will be to you as God. That's the goal. It's all about relationships. So we see it in Exodus. So I didn't put the scripture down in there, but this is Exodus 6. Exodus 6. All right, so we're getting, building the picture. Who is this God that comes from heaven to earth? Well, we have a couple more pieces to add to it. And this probably is, this classroom is a little awkward here for me, but I'm making it work. <laughs> Exodus, hey, I didn't have any classroom when I was teaching and when I taught in, um, in Togo, West Africa, so this is great. <laughs> All right, the next, so the third text, so we got Exodus 3, we got Exodus 6, and now we have Exodus 34, 6 through 7, if you're writing notes, taking notes. Because we have yet another question by Moses and then the response by God about who he is. And let's read these verses. This is my light. These are my, you know, everybody have a, 
You have your Bible verses, don't you, that you love, that you cling to? Yeah. That you can't live without? These are mine. Exodus, Exodus 34, uh, verses 6 through 7. I wrote a master's thesis on these verses. Um, I'm writing a book on these verses. Mm-hmm. And I want to know the God of these verses. Uh, Moses says to God, uh, is in terms of question, show me your glory in chapter 33, verse 18. And then the Lord said, I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim, what? My name. So Moses wants to see God's glory, and God says, I'm going to show you my name. So what does that mean? I'm going to show you my character. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then we read in verse 6, And the Lord passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh. And now he's defining for himself, who, he's defining who he is himself for Moses. Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. Show me your glory. And he says, I will cause, I will proclaim my name. So do you hear what we're learning now? The third piece about who is this God that comes from heaven to earth? Who is this God who's relentlessly pursuing people for relationship? Well, now he says it a bit more fully that he is a God who is gracious and merciful. Ugh. Slow to anger. Do you know what that means in Hebrew? That's another thing. So the name Yahweh means, it means an active verb, I am, to be. And then in, uh, when he says he's slow to anger, it means that he has a long nose. Like Pinocchio? You know, you know, so it means that, you know how whenever you get heated up in anger, it's kind of like you, the visual is like snorting. And you breathe heavy. Right? And it comes through your nostrils. It's just a really, it's in biblical Hebrew, it says that his nose is long as opposed to humans' noses who are short. Proverbs says our noses are short because we get angry easily. Like God's nose is long, meaning it takes a long time for that puff of steam to come out <laughs> before he actually lets out his anger. Uh, so he's slow to anger because. Because why? This is just a beautiful picture. If we were just to build, we could spend all day talking about this. But he's slow to anger because of his compassion for his people. He has deep affection. Now, can I tell you that he is saying this of himself on the heels of idolatry, on the heels of the golden calf incident. This is who he is in revealing himself to Moses. In other words, I am a God who is committed to relationship thick through thick or thin. And basically, what they just did to him with the golden... So this is God's response to the golden calf narrative. He's showing his affection and commitment to his people in this relationship regardless. But the peace that enables the relationship to continue is the part of the declaration that says, what? Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. When it says iniquity, transgression, and sin, it's just all the terminology possible for any kind of waywardness uh, from Yahweh. So he basically is adding a lot to this piece of who he is. He's gracious and merciful, slow to anger, which means he's not a hothead. The slow to anger is very debatable. Pardon? The slow to anger. He's angry so often in the Old Testament. You do see it. For such long periods of time. Well, you see puffs of steam coming, and he, in this passage. He stays angry, or people in exile for a long time. He just removes himself from his people for a long time. So I don't know, that that slow anger is kind of like a 
Oh, but Isaiah says something beautiful about, you're right. There are these puffs of steam that come out, and people are in exile for, you know, uh, generations, right? Oh, 70 some years, right? Yeah, it's like saying you didn't cross with your wife, stay cross for a month. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but you, oh, that's terrible. But you know what? His anger is but for a moment, says Isaiah, and his mercy is for a year. So it compares, so yes, yes. And um, so there are several passages in Isaiah that reflect mm -hmm. that reality that they experienced the sting of Yahweh's wrath. Ezra and Nehemiah said it too. They feared the anger of God because it brought them into exile. They feared the consequences, absolutely. But the fact that it took so long for that to happen, it took about 800 years for him to, you know, bring the full consequences of sin on them through the exile. So well, Exile was a number of years as well. Exile itself was a number of years. So it took about 800 years for it to happen because he was, rele he was holding back. And, and, and Ezekiel 20 shows very clearly how he wanted to dispel his anger, but he withheld. So Exodus, uh, Ezekiel 20 is really important in that. And then Isaiah, how, yes, they experienced his anger. But compared to his mercy and compassion, it was, sh believe it or not, it was short. Yes. I've seen uh, Lord translated sovereign Lord. Yeah. In, right? Yeah. So the implication, I guess, is if he's sovereign, he can do whatever he wants. Right. And when we deserve death, then any little bit of grace that he gives us, that's huge. Right? Because when he's Lord and we deserve death. That's right. Right. Oh yeah, this, so that we could be here all. We could be here all morning talking about the, just that phrase, "slow to anger," the and the character of God. But that just that one slice, right? Um, I'll find you the verses in Isaiah. There, there are three times where it says um, about his anger was for a moment, but his his mercy was with the longevity of it. And actually, can I just say to just to get to your point and not to, belab to belabor it, but. He does say, in his own explanation of who he is, Yahweh Yahweh, he does say that he has more affinity for compassion and mercy because he's maintaining love to thousands and forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, uh, and he punishes the children to the third and the fourth generation. So you can compare those numbers. The third and fourth is small compared to the thousands that he's extending his mercy. So even in his own statement of himself, he's making a distinction between what, you know, the scale, if you're going to weigh it, he's going to err, dare I say that, he's going to tip on the side of compassion and grace and mercy as opposed to, yes. I think the absence of annihilation is illustration of his compassion. That too, that's right, that's a beautiful point, exactly. We, we, and we could could go on and on. Great points. And so what we are learning, what do we then, what do we put together then with these three texts uh, that we're seeing? So it shows he takes sin seriously. So we see two sides. He forgives. Oh, we got to get this all out. It's two sides of the same coin. He forgives, but yet he judges. Correct? Pardon? Doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. So in other words, there are consequences for those that keep on sinning. So you, right at this outset in Exodus, this prepares us then for who this God is throughout the biblical narrative. Because you're going to see him r relenting and, and holding back from his anger um, because of his compassion and his mercy. But then there's a boiling point he reaches. And that's why that boiling point ran up here in, in Ezekiel. He, he leaves his earthly dwelling. And he says it because he was, Ezekiel chapter 8, he left the premise. Is, he left his physical place because he was so angered by their sin. And so he says, I'm splitting, I'm leaving. Their sin. So you see then the picture. So the term then, what I want to say is this, is you got, who is this God? Well, I am who I am. I am is equal to Yahweh. I am 
means then Yahweh, because he says this twice, he says Yahweh, Yahweh. Did I write that down just to find, let's have that there. Yahweh, Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh. Or again, the Lord, the Lord. Or, but do you see how it's fleshed out now? From the very first mention of it, there's more to the meaning of this name. It's about, this is the character of God on paper, as it were, as it's described. And so his very name, if you will, okay, his very name means something incredible. It means that the, Yahweh is the major designation for God in the Bible, in the Old Testament. 6,200 times, roughly. 6,828 times. Elohim is generic for deity. All right, so he, we see then through this very term, he's, he's intimate with his people by virtue of his, he's going to act on their behalf because he's present with them. It, a close relationship is involved. Immediacy and presence, all right? A being who is present. Does any of that sound familiar? A God who's going to act. He's either going to save or he's going to judge. He's going to rescue and deliver or he's also going to rain down fire on enemies. And that includes his own people if they are acting like an enemy to him. Okay? But then this all is propelling us where? Do you think it's propelling us? Of course, you know where this is going. Who is this God? Well, who is this God who is relentlessly pursuing relationship? Well, we're seeing these pieces right here. If we turn now then and think about one other text. Isaiah. Remember Isaiah? Chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah tells us in very clear terms. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This is an incredible passage. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is King Ahaz who's refusing to believe and trust that God's going to save him from some military battle that's about to take place. God says, you're not going to, you're not going to, see, this, you're not going to see defeat. But he didn't trust the Lord. And so the Lord says, okay, he's going to give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and, birth and, and give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. Okay. God with us. We've already seen God with them, like here, right? Now, Isaiah points us to God with us. And then where do we see that fleshed out most, most fully? Where do we see that fleshed out most fully? In the incarnation. Turn to chapter, well, you don't have to turn to it, but I'll just, Matthew. Matthew, the name, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I don't know where anything is in my New Testament. <laughs> I'm, stu I'm stuck in the back, I mean, the beginning of the book. Did I say that? Pardon? I get, I get to read faster. Okay. Chapter 1 of Matthew, verses 20 through 21. Because the name that's given to Joseph's baby is critical to the storyline that I'm developing here for us. Uh, 20 through 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he, why, he will do what? He will save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua, right? And what does Joshua mean? Joshua means Yahweh saves, not God, Yah. Yah saves. What does his name mean? Yahushua. Yahushua means Yahweh saves. I am who I am. This is the God who's present and ready to act. How is he going to act in the incarnation? He's going to save his people from their sins. He's going to be present to do something about the problem. That's quite powerful, isn't it? When you see the trajectory of the name and the significance of the meaning of the name. So when Jesus then is born in Matthew chapter, in Matthew chapter 1, then Matthew is rightly, I think, of course, rightly interpreting, which he often does, the prophecies of the Old Testament, but he's interpreting Isaiah, the unique birth, right there 
of Jesus is the fulfillment of Emmanuel of Isaiah. And by the way, Isaiah, good old Isaiah, prophesied this moment about 740 years before it took place. It's amazing. It's an amazing prophecy and an amazing event. And so he prophesied of this very special presence of God. And here we see in Emmanuel the reality. He prepares, Isaiah prepares us then for the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. He prepares us for the idea that God is going to be with humankind in a more immediate way than a tabernacle or a temple. But the most beautiful thing about John, about the incarnation, is what the Gospel of John says about Jesus. Because he's going to be near to his people. He's going to save and deliver his people from their sins, as we just read in Matthew. But the But the gospel writer John, I think, brings together most of this redemptive history in a beautiful way in what he says in chapter 1, verses, well, well, verse 14 and following. But John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18 is another key text in this whole discussion. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. At least I know where that is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I can follow the... Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay, here we are. We don't, I don't think we have time. Oh, maybe we do. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him, um, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Okay? The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. So, of course, this is speaking of the incarnation. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. And then he lowers the boom. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Same word that's used for the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And it's more. John says, we, we beheld his glory. Do we remember we talked about the glory cloud over the tabernacle and over the temple? Now, in the incarnation, John is, can touch that glory cloud because that glory cloud is flesh and blood. And that's why he says, we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, and then he has a statement full of grace and truth. Same words that are used of Exodus 34 about Yahweh. So do you see what John is doing? In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, he is connecting the dots. He's connecting the biblical theological dots, if you will. He comes at the right time. He comes at our hour of need. Uh, and he comes to, what does Jesus come to do? To save us, but to reconcile us in relationship. It's all about relationship. He's reconciling people to himself through Jesus. So the incarnation is the means to that eternal relationship that was promised back to Abraham about a people and a place and a presence. So, our, so John chapter 1 has echoes of, of the, the previous redemptive history. When, we, when he says he tabernacled amongst us. So it's basically called the infleshing. You know, incarnation means infleshing. That's what it means, right? And so I think that one of my colleagues' quotes is very appropriate here. It's a New Testament scholar. I still like New Testament scholars. Um, <laughs> who is this God that comes from heaven to earth? What is his name? So much more than the name Yahweh. It's a character that's being revealed. And his name, what began here, right, then becomes fulfilled in 
what we learn about Jesus and the incarnation. He's going to save his people from their sins. He's going to be with them. And so, you want to know what the character of God is like? Study Jesus. Do you want to know what the holiness of God is like? Study Jesus. Do you want to know what the wrath of God is like? Study Jesus. Do you want to know what the forgiveness of God is like? Study Jesus. Do you, know what, do you want to know what the glory of God is like? Study Jesus all the way to that wretched cross. Study Jesus. That's a quote by D.A. Carson, and it's profound, isn't it? And so it is all about relationship. He comes from heaven to earth to do what he promised Abraham that he would do. To make for himself a what? A people, a place, and a presence. And why? And, and, and what does he reveal when that happens? His character. It reveals his character. God pursues us. We don't pursue him. He pers- Do you know the kind of people he's pursuing in this entire narrative? Something that we haven't had time to talk about. Do you know who he's pursuing? People with hard necks. Stiff hearts. People who are stubborn. Us. Me. Us. <laughs> Me. I was going to say you, Sue, but no. <laughs> Th- that makes the story even more remarkable, doesn't it? About his character, his character vis-a-vis our character. We, we, we're idolaters. We turn our backs on him the very minute we get a chance to do so. And so... He desired to repair any barriers in the relationship. The cross provides that barrier. He deals with that sin barrier at the cross, and then he continues to deal with it uh, by the way that we experience him, of course, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, then, is the fullest revelation of the character of God. His first coming promises something about the second coming. Because Philippians tells us this. You know Philippians. This is a profound verse. Okay, where's Philippians? Oh, there it is. I put a little tag by it. (laughs) I had to cheat so I wouldn't take forever to find it. Um, Therefore, speaking of Christ, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. It's not an identity. It's a character. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess or acknowledge what? That Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. Do you see how it's all, it's all, so right now in the incarnation, it's the now and the not yet. But when he comes back. When he comes back, that reality is his character will be exposed to all. So, yes? Where in Philippians is that? Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 9 through 11, which takes us to the end of the book. Because we then have come full circle. I really wanted to highlight the character of God from this moment here in Exodus to the incarnation. And now my circles are getting all well confusing, but now we come to the really the climactic moment. Because this is what we read. Turn if you have you don't have to turn there, but in, in Revelation chapter one, verses one, seven through eight, we have some profound statements. This The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. All right, so he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. And then this is what we read in verses 7 and 8. This is what the angel tells John in this incredible revelation. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. And then, boom, verse 8. 
So he's, he's, he's quoting some parts of the Old Testament there. He's quoting probably Zechariah. I, then at verse 8, I am, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who is, who is, who is, who was, who's going to come. Wow. We didn't talk about the I am sayings in Jesus, in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I skipped over that. Because, but John's Gospel, beyond chapter 1, fulfills the I am statements everywhere. I'm the bread of life. I am the light. I am the gate. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the vine. And in all of those I am statements, it reveals who he is. But now we come to the climactic moment of the I am in Revelation. And that's what we read. But there's even more. And then chapter 22 of Revelation. 22 verse 7. Look, I am coming soon. If you know Greek, it's ego amy. All the ego amy statements of the Gospels, right, are here in the Revelation as well. Look, I am coming soon. And then that's verse, uh, it's, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. 12 and 13, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. And then he repeats, I am the beginning and the end. The first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last. I am the alpha, the omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. From Genesis to Revelation, from Eden to eternity. He's a God who comes from heaven to earth for the sake of relationship. And he's going to come again. Verse 16 of 22. I, Jesus, now he says it's, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. And then this is what he says. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Who is this God who reveals himself? His name is Yahweh. We see it in the incarnation, and he promises he's going to come back. And so this is why, then, we come full circle, because when we come to Revelation, we end up with that reality that was promised to Abram, of a people, a place, and a presence. Put it back in the middle, too, because that's where I've been putting it. I know I got it up there. So, I don't know about you, but I want to put my trust in this God who saves, who delivers, who is ready to act in our time of need. And through the Holy Spirit, he's acting on our behalf all of the time. I kind of skipped the Holy Spirit part of this, but, 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 but we, he reveals who he is in the Holy, by the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives. And he's saving and rescuing us and delivering us and comforting us, giving us peace, uh, showing us how he hates sin, how he forgives sin daily and on an ongoing basis because of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So it's not just the incarnation that reveals his character, but it's in believing and, of course, and of course the deposit of the Holy Spirit in us. So it's, it's a powerful picture about who God is and who is this God who, who comes from heaven to earth? And so then we come then to the, I think the, well, the, high, the highlight of it all, because we learn in chapter 7 of Revelation of this. In terms of people, are there a few up there? Are, you, are there a few around the throne? I looked, and there before me, John says, was a great multitude that no one could count. And where do they come from? Every tribe, every nation, people, and language. Now, when we started this discussion, right, we talked about the, divide, the presence of the Lord, right? The people was very, very, it was Israel in the wilderness. 
Do you see how it's expanded? Boom. Oh. So it's, it's showing that the promises to Abraham are being fulfilled at this moment. Every tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they're wearing white robes. And wait, they were singing in a loud voice the exclusive character of God. Salvation belongs to our God. An exclusive act that only he could perform. An exclusive God. Salvation belongs to our God, who reigns because he sits on the throne. Do you see it? His character in in the statement of those that surround the throne are proclaiming his character. And all the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and all they could do all they could do is fall on their faces before the throne and add their voice and what's their voice. Amen. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to who? Our God. They've embraced the character of God. It's, he's theirs now, right? He's rescued them for relationship. And so what are they doing? They're giving him exclusive worship because of his exclusive character. And then John says, then one of the elders asked John, these in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? And I like John answers kind of like Ezekiel does. "Um, Sir, you know. And he said, they, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are continually before the throne of God and they serve him. How is it? They, it says they serve him day and night in his temple. How in the world do they serve him? With their worship. Giving him unending praise about his character and who he is. That's the only job they have. Is worship, unending worship of this God who has done everything for their behalf. And the, verse 17, the lamb was at the center of the throne. He will be their shepherd. All right, but then there's a few. So that's the people. We see the people. And then let's think more about the place. You ready? I saw, Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth. The first passed away. They were no longer. I saw now the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down. Where? Heaven to earth. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling is is now with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. The reality of the divine presence. I am who I am. I am present, not distant. And so what we see then is the place for the people to gather. It's called territorial expansion. It's no longer in the wilderness. It's no longer in a piece of real estate in the Middle East. It's no longer even Judea, Jerusalem, and the Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. It's, well, it is the, it's the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, I, that just boggles my mind. Mm-hmm. New Jerusalem coming down. Where? Who, who's doing all this? He initiated it from heaven to earth. And then we read 22 of verse 21. Uh, sorry, sorry, verse 22 of chapter 21. Surprise, John tells us. After all of this, after all these architectural structures that revealed the presence of God and revealed his character. John says in verse 22 of chapter 21, I didn't see a temple in the city, in this territorial expansion of the new heavens and the earth that he's calling a city. A city, big, right? I did not see a temple. Why? Because who? The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon or to shine on it. Why? Because what's giving it light? What's giving it light? The presence of the, the, the majestic presence of God, which is described by one word, glory. 
No longer will there be any curse. Verse 3 of chapter 22. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him through this unending worship, and they will see his face, and here it is. And his name will be on their foreheads. They will forever be his people. They will forever be holy and demonstrate his holy character at this moment. And they will forever be with him. Has God been faithful to his promises to Abraham? You bet he has. The relentless pursuit of God is all about relationship. So let's just close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this just mini discussion of these realities that we have spoken about, this big picture perspective um, about your character and about your relentless pursuit of us. We just marvel at it as we look at it together in these weeks. And I pray, Father, that you would just prick and poke our hearts, that you would help us, Lord, to wrestle with what we have seen and things that might be new to us or things that have been a review for us, Lord. Help us to chew on these nuggets, Lord, and to be transformed and changed by them. And Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for your character that has been revealed in these crescendos in redemptive history. We thank you that we are on this side of the cross. We thank you that we, like the disciples, have beheld his glory because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I thank you, Lord, that we await the second coming. So would you give us expectation and hope and encouragement for this last leg of this journey on earth? We thank you that you have promised that you would be with us till the end of the ages. And we cling to that promise today because the reality of the divine presence is that we will be with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen